Hey, it's Norm from Tested, and we're here at Comic Con 2015 to unveil a special project. <laughs> it's a project, actually, a collaboration, the first we've done, a West Coast collaboration between yes. Frank Capolito and Punish Props, Bill Duran. Yep. How are you guys doing? Our West Coast, huh? I know, yeah. it's right. Sorry, Harrison. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you guys know Frank. He does amazing creature effects for us. He did Zoidberg Project, uh, the Farnsworth Project, and we try to come up with a good project that you guys could work on because, Bill, you make armor, costumes, yeah. and like space rifles. A lot of space guns. Yeah. yeah. So what we came up with was the District 9 assault rifle, the alien assault rifle from that great Weta film. Yes. Um, there was a prop out there, the one-to-one right. -one scale that Weta sold at Comic-Con like four years ago, four or five years ago, sold out immediately, right. and we've coveted it, and we're recreating it. But let's start with the hand. We brought you okay. in, Frank, to make the hand, and you're all dressed up as right. Lucas. It's great, look at that facial hair, amazing. And Frank, you've made this, there you go. Uh, the prop Aha! hand. Oh, Check that out. That looks fantastic. How legit is that? Put it on. So Goes good. perfectly with my outfit. <laughs> Fits in. It's the, it's the left hand, very important. Yeah. Right, left hand. And now I can fire alien weapons. That's right. And so we need an <laughs> alien, alien weapon for you to fire. So let's pop this open. I haven't seen it yet. You haven't seen it yet, nope. Frank? Oh nope. my goodness. Let's pop it open. It's oh cold. my goodness! Oh, oh. That was great. There's holes there because I cut More holes foam. in the wrong spot. <laughs> oh. More foam. And I'm not, I don't know how helpful I'm being. Here we go. <laughs> I think I can. Pull this guy out. Wow. Wow. Oh, and this needs to be liberated too, that part yes. right there. Do you have a, something sharp to cut that out? Definitely do. This is a one-to-one -one replica of the alien assault rifle. I can't from get it. We packed Nine. it in there pretty well. <laughs> it's so cool. Now we're gonna take this there to the go. floor. But before we do that, uh, because this is a tested video, we want you guys to learn something. I wanted to talk about how we made these, uh, how Frank made the alien hand, and how Bill, how, how you replicated this perfect replica of the, the space rifle. Now it. to do that, we're gonna go back in the past a little bit, back to Frank's shop, over the Bill's shop, and talk about the making of. All right. All right, Frank, we are in your shop. Yep. Not at Comic-Con. And uh, <laughs> this is where it all begins, at least for the hand. Yeah. For this regarding hand. Um, and you've sculpted it already. Well, uh, but talk, talk it's about, almost done. Almost done, but I want to learn about the sculpting process. Yeah. Uh, it all, always, of course, starts with reference. So what was your reference for this? Um, actually, I went to the RPF and I started looking up what other people had. And some people had taken photos from, um, from an exhibit where this hand was. And uh, the hardest thing to find was pictures of the palm. But our buddy Mark Dubow from Tippett sent me that photo of the palm. And so that's... Um, so you got, you know, you got the underneath the hand and the top of the hand and the practical prop, mm -hmm. actually getting photos of the exhibit, super helpful, yeah. much better than any production photos, any screen caps you could possibly yep. get from a Blu-ray. Um, and then from there, did you, what was your sense of scale? How did you know the, how big to make the hand? Well, there's, there's the photos of him holding the gun and then there's some photos of him like uh, about to chop, try and chop his hand off. And mm -hmm. so I could kind of figure out how far past his fingertips it went. Um, and it was just kind of making it up. And I, I think, you know, when you kind of get get in there, I th it feels like this is gonna be about the right size. So the practical prop, you imagine uh, the actor, whoever wore it, had to be able to wear it. So mm -hmm. you also had to distribute your fingers on the inside. Yeah. Um, so that's what, two fingers? Is it a Vulcan salute? It's a Vulcan salute. Awesome. Is a Vulcan salute left or right hand? Does it's it matter? A, it's right hand. Right hand. Well, this is a left hand. Oh, oh, that's right. Okay, which is also important. This is the Vulcan FU. Uh, no, I don't think they exactly do it that way either. <laughs> but uh, the left hand was also getting that hand right was appropriate. Yeah. And so, was it a very standard sculpt? You started with uh, any? Well, I started with making a core. Mm -hmm. um, so I did a life cast in my own hand. Uh, I just basically made this hand and dunked it into a bucket of alginate, mm -hmm. and then uh, poured plaster in. Because all I need is a, a sculpture base. This isn't going to be a core to like run foam or anything. It's just a form to get the proportions correct in my hand. Right. So I have a plaster copy of my hand inside of this, and then just started plowing clay on and worked out the proportions as I start kind of adding clay. And then how long did this sculpture take? This is probably about a day into it. Okay. And it's probably about a half a day to finish got to finish all the texture up in here and then just refine a bunch of the stuff in here and then we've talked about when you do a sculpt uh, you also use reference photos from the real world to mm -hmm. get textures for this 
what was the inspiration? You know, I didn't really pull anything else because some of these close-up photos of the actual thing are just are, are so telling of what they were what they were going after. So it's kind of easy to just emulate that style mm -hmm. based on the reference from the actual sculpture. Mm -hmm. And then, so you have a little more work to do here, mm -hmm. and I could see that uh, you're going to cover cloth up for mm -hmm. the center part, yeah. uh, just like in the actual prop. So you don't need to actually to put too much detail there. No, but I'm gonna I'm gonna sculpt it all the way down just because. I'm gonna sculpt the whole thing, right. but then we'll uh, we'll get some muslin or something like that and stain it up and okay. wrap it. Um, and then after that, you're gonna mold it. Yes, we're gonna do a two-part ultra cal mold because mm -hmm. all I need is a plaster mold on this. It's not like we're making anything fancy. It's just gonna be a latex glove. So mm -hmm. for that part, then we'll pour latex into the mold and I'll paint it up. All right, so uh, let's get to that. All right, Bill, so time to check in with you, and you shot a bunch of footage at your shop. Let's talk about your sculpting process first. For reference, you actually had like a small scale version of this gun that Weta also sold. Yeah, they made a quarter scale model of that gun, which was surprisingly accurate. Uh, and I was able to take measurements off that and get a lot of the proportions right that way. And it was handy because online you actually found a website that listed the exact dimensions of the full size, so it was easy for you to scale that up. Yeah, once I knew how long the gun was, I could uh, build it. I drew the whole thing up in SketchUp, made mm. a 3D model of it, uh, of all my pieces and layers and different thicknesses of MDF. And as long as it was the right length, then I knew it would, everything would be to scale. And layering is really how the body of this gun was put together. So sheets of MDF that then you could work out the bevels and details on a bandsaw and other shop tools. Yeah, that's a pretty common way for me to build space guns by layering different uh, pieces together that way. And this gun was no different, you know? If it works, uh, why, why deviate, you know? A lot of the areas, if I couldn't get the bevel just right using a saw, then I would just fill it in later with uh, body filler and sand it down until it was nice and smooth. Lots of sanding. So Any much sanding. Project. Yes. Oh my goodness. And then there are also round pieces. And how did you make those? A lot of the tubes and cylinder type things I used on my lathe. I used a high density polyurethane tooling foam that Frank says is called Ren Shape. And uh, I put those in my lathe and I turned the pieces out that way. Awesome. And then once you had that, that was basically the assembly of a prototype that you would then go to mold um, to make so you can make replicas of the gun. Exactly, yeah. Especially like those tubes. There's 24 tubes along the barrel there. I didn't want to put my lathe through that or myself through that. So we made a mold of those so that we can make copies. Awesome. So let's time to check back in with Frank and see how he's doing uh, with his finished sculpture. Alrighty. All right, Frank, so we've checked in with Bill to see how he started fabricating that first prototype of the Alien Assault Rifle. At this point, you've actually already made the mold mm -hmm. for the Alien Hand. The sculpture's gone. Yeah. The sculpt's gone, but what we have is a beautiful mold. Tell me about this mold. Uh, this is a plaster mold. This is made out of UltraCal 30. To make a mold like this, it's kind of similar to how we did that lightsaber mold, where you take clay and you build a wall, and it's gonna be a two halves. Two part. But instead of building the box and then just filling it with plaster, I, I kind of freeform the, the plaster so that it's um, oh. kind of got these contours and stuff like that. Just makes it a little bit lighter weight. Other that's than layering over? Yeah, you do a couple layer, like four layers. Um, and that's just so it's not a big, heavy block of cement. And you're also using a lot of material that yeah, way. Yeah, a lot less material if I do it this way. Mm. I noticed there's registration points here. Yep, here. this is all registrations the same way I did like when we did the Zoidberg project. S same molding principles in all of these projects that we do. Now, why a plaster mold as opposed to something like a silicone mold? Well, with silicone or plastic molds, they don't have a porosity, which is something you want when you're doing a latex casting. This is going to be just a regular slush latex glove. It's not going to be foam latex, not going to be silicone. It. We could do stuff like that, but it just makes a little bit more sense just to make a hollow latex casting. So you want a mold that's a little bit porous so that it kind of soaks in that the uh, ammonia and the, the, the fluids in the latex. If it was plastic, that all that moisture stuck just, in there. And it doesn't dry. Plaster actually sucks it out, mm -hmm. helps it dry, yeah. and helps you create that layer of the latex. Yep. Um, so I just want to squirt this down before I close it up. And that's going to help kind of let the latex like settle into some of these details. Okay. Pop that perfectly close. Uh, stronger than rubber bands. Oh yeah. Let's 
gonna hold that for me. All right, Frank, you got this sealed up the two halves and you're just pouring latex in. No need to mix A parts, B parts, or anything like that. No, just fill it up. So it's not quite full yet. Mm -hmm. So I want to just kind of roll it around. Gotta make sure you fill it. In the hand, getting latex in all the, the finger mm -hmm. holes is not too difficult. If it was a more complicated mold, then you need to, to actually do a little more slushing. Yeah. So by putting this plastic on here, it keeps the surface from creating a skin. All I want is the plaster to soak out the moisture and create a skin on the inside. So the longer you let it sit in here, the thicker a skin you get. So if we let it sit about 20 minutes, it should um, gather enough on the surface. Then we'll just dump it out. And that's just based on your experience. You know, that much time gives you like a wearable skin where it's gonna be thick enough and durable enough. Should be good enough. Awesome. Then let's wait for 20 minutes and come back and check out this casting. Cool. So a little over 20 minutes has passed. Yep. Time to get rid of that excess latex. Cool. Ceram wrap kept the interior nice and gooey. Yep. How thick do you think the skin is? Uh, I don't know. We'll see. Oh, wow, that's a lot of latex. And that's all reusable? Yeah, as long as you put that back in a bucket and let it sit. Now, we're obviously not gonna be able to open this. Not right now. Not right now. We'll open it tomorrow morning. Uh, how long does it take usually for this this thickness to, to really dry out and harden? It's kind of hard to say. It depends on like temperature and how thick it was and you know, how much humidity is in the air, like all that kind of stuff. Kind of overnight, right. you know, maybe a little bit longer. Well, we'll wait overnight and I'll check in with Bill to see how his molding's going. So Bill, for your molding process, you didn't have a big stone mold. You actually uh, did your first matrix mold. That's right. Uh, since all of these pieces are going to be rigid when I'm done with them, I wanted a flexible mold. So I used silicone for the smaller pieces, simple dump molds. Mm -hmm. But for the big piece, I wanted to try and make a matrix mold like all the big kids are doing these days. So what was your process for doing that? Uh, in general, the entire piece gets covered in a layer of clay that will be replaced by silicone later on. That layer of clay gets covered in a jacket mold. In this case, we used uh, fiberglass resin and fiberglass cloth to make uh, that rigid outside jacket mold. Uh, and then once that part is built in two pieces, we rescue the, the master out of there, clean all that clay up, and then measure how much clay we use so we know how much silicone to use. Then we put it all back together, and then we pour in some silicone. And the silicone just fills the void where the clay once was. Exactly. And then that gives you that rigid outside fiberglass with the silicone on the inside that can be a complex shape. And then you also, does the prototype get destroyed or you still have the prototype? No, the, the, the prototype is getting buried with me. Uh. <laughs> uh, no, that's at home. And uh, I actually have a box. I call it my box of chocolate because most of the pieces I would spray with like a dark red primer, it looks like chocolate, but that's, I have all my masters. Uh, and this one just gets thrown on the pile. And then so in casting this, there are a bunch of pieces. How many molds did you actually end up making? Um, I know there are 34 pieces total. Some of the molds were used multiple times. So I think there's a, a 10 maybe molds for mm. this guy. And, how, and then the casting process, is it all one same material, just a urethane resin? Yeah, most of, the, actually all the pieces are urethane resin. I use a couple of different varieties though. For the slush casting on the big tube on the bottom, I use some Onyx Fast. Uh, that I've been jonesing to try since a lot of my um, uh, prop maker buddies have been uh, singing its praises. So I gave that a go and it worked really, really well. And then the rest of it was done in Smoothcast 300. Awesome. So you're casting it, Frank's casting his hand. Let's go back to Comic-Con and take a look at those final finished pieces. All right. And then the butt goes over here. The shoulder side. And then get screwed on, awesome. And now we're back in the room uh, to talk about the finishing process. Now, Frank, when you left off with you last, you would just pour that latex, and you pulled that <laughs> latex out of that heavy mold. Yeah, big stone um, mold. Big stone mold. How long did you have to leave it in there? Uh, I ended up leaving it there for about a day and a half. Okay. And as it came out, uh, the material is pretty good. It's just like a latex. It's just latex, like, like, a, like a Halloween mask. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, but we actually, you put some padding inside, right? Yeah, well, I, I, I trimmed all the seam off of it mm -hmm. and uh, just 
hit it with a Dremel really quick. Mm. Um, and then I, I shove some cotton in the tip of the fingers just so that they don't flop around too Give much. some rigidity. Yeah. And um, then can you talk about the paint process a little bit? That final yeah, paint process? The, the paint process is exactly like I've done a bunch of times before on the Zoidberg project or when we did the model kit painting. Yes. Do, um, I used rubber cement paint and I did a bunch of washes where I'd put a bunch of color on and then wipe it off. Um, and then I airbrushed a little bit to just kind of make some other, other parts pop. And or the base color, like a, like a greenish color um, as a base? Well, the base color of the latex is like a, a tannish color, mm -hmm. and so I did the first one I did was a rub of green, okay, and then I did uh, some browns, and then I took some darker browns and some blacks and put them on the ridges of the fingers. Wow! And then for this part, this is just some muslin that I cut up and just stained up with a little bit of red. And Bill, how does it feel? Uh, it feels like it's going to be warm in a couple hours, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> latex doesn't breathe that's really true. Great. Uh, but that's nothing new for for me. And uh, no, it, it's cool. I feel pretty articulate. It'll, my hand fits on the gun, which is really cool. Uh, yeah, it works. It's very convincing. I already feel a little weird. Alieny? Yeah, a little alieny. You need that one big contact lens. I know. Right? Yeah, so, right, the big eye. Yeah, still working on that. We'll CG in that later. <laughs> so, Bill, let's talk about the finishing right. for the assault rifle um, and point to all the details. So, taking the pieces out of the mold, uh, the bunch of molds assembly. What was that like? We did. We tried to do all the painting before we put all these pieces together because a lot of them, uh, like it's hard to get around them. Mm. So like all of these silly tube things here all got painted before we assembled it all together. And assembly was almost one of the last things we did. Um, but the, a lot of these are little are different pieces. So this is a separate piece. The two barrel pieces are separate. These are all. This is actually three pieces. Um, so once they were all painted, they all. It was when we did all the assembly. And then for the individual painting, like to get this effect, you know, just, we just primed it black and then spray painted. Yeah, just a little bit of silver spray paint, um, just to dust the end of it a little bit. Mm. And then of course there's a lot of weathering here. Yes. It's great. It looks grimy, especially the, the nooks and crannies. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that process? Sure. So the whole thing, like the main body piece was cast in a white resin just to have a nice base for it, but we went over that with some more white paint mm. uh, just to make sure it all looked nice and, and factory made. But then we immediately stuck, started just covering it in grime. Uh, lots of black and brown and um, burnt sienna. I wanted to use a little bit more of the yellows too to look more like dirty like alien, not just like muddy. So we did a lot of different uh, passes and washes on that. In the white, I mean, the white, you get anything on it and it looks dirty right away, so yeah. that's really cool. The darker spots, I, like I said, I use more of that yellow oak around the darker black spots, so that's a little more contrast there. <laughs> Uh, and to look a little bit more like sand or alien grime in those areas. And then also decals. So I've got a vinyl cutter, which if you don't have one, you gotta get one, they're pretty handy. And uh, I went and trimmed them out with the vinyl cutter and then laid down some low tack vinyl stenciling on there and then all I had to do was either spray or brush paint right on there. Peel it away and you got these really nice looking clean decals. Comparing this, because we actually have, I'll tell you guys, there is the full size one in Adam's Cave. I gotta tell you, it looks almost perfect. And because you base yours on just photos on the internet, mm -hmm. that small scale replica, yep. and it could not look better. And you also made this beautiful stand. I did, yeah. This is all just stuff from the hardware store. This, the, the grating is something for vents, I think. Okay. I don't know, I don't actually do a lot of home repair. <laughs> uh, and then these are all just PVC fixtures that I painted up to look all uh, metallic and I covered them in a uh, patina so like an acrylic metallic paint with some patina spray you put on there to make it so it's actual rust uh, then I sealed it so don't worry about tetanus nice and protected these came out so nicely and they use so many different processes we're yes. talking about you know latex casting a giant block for the mold matrix molding on your end yeah uh, resins you know smooth on provided a lot of product got to thank them as well and it looks like it's it all is paid off and the only thing we gotta do now is take it to the floor. Yes. So you ready to head to the floor? Yeah, I wanna go to the Weta booth. That's right, Weta has a booth here at Comic-Con. They made the original prop. Let's see if they can tell the difference. Oh, that totally works. That totally works. <laughs> Bill, I would call that a successful project. The arm looks great, the gun looks amazing. You're able to show it to people at the Weta booth who made the original. 
It's so cool. We'll of course have more stuff from Comic-Con at Tested. You can check out Bill's work at PunishProps.com. He has an amazing book that teaches you how to mix, to make armor, to make guns. It's a Bonesmith book. Check it out. PunishProps.com, Test.com. I'm Norm, this is Bill Duran. Frank's wandering. Hope you didn't lose him. <laughs> of course, I'll see you guys. Bye.